Hey guys, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm coming to you with my triumphant return to my Viking series. And since I have on my snake print turtleneck, we can only be talking about the greatest of all time, the goat, Ragnar Lothbrok. Uh, in actuality, we're really not going to discuss him in any great amount of detail today at all because this video today is going to be talking about the historical basis for his sons. We are going to be talking about the sources and the historical annals where his sons are mentioned. I felt like it was appropriate to do this today because if I have made my calculations correctly. Today that I am posting this is December 4th, 2019, and the sixth season of Vikings is about to air. And without Vikings, I would not be familiar with Ragnar. I would certainly not be familiar with his sons. So perhaps the most important question that you have right now is why we aren't discussing the historical sources or the historical basis for Ragnar himself. Uh, and the reason for that is many, many fold. You will get a different answer from a different historian depending on the time of day, the day of the week, whether or not we have a full moon, as to whether or not somebody will tell you that they truly believe we can view Ragnar as a historical figure. More likely, Ragnar is an amalgamation of a lot of different figures from various historical sources. Realistically, Ragnar is a figure that we can view, in my opinion, as someone on par with Robin Hood or King Arthur. He is someone who is a bunch of different legends compiled into one to kind of become this hero of an age and this hero of the early Norse period. Unlike their so-called father, Ragnar, most of Ragnar's sons we can verify as historical figures and we know where they were at certain points in history. Uh, perhaps most famously, this is shown with the most famous of Ragnar's sons, Ivar the Boneless. Yes, I'm calling him Ivar uh, because I am going to do my darndest to make sure that I am doing the correct pronunciation of all of these names. I will do my darndest as well to make sure that the names are on screen for you to see in their original Old Norse. So to kind of get something that might be a little confusing out of the way first, when I show Ragnar's name, for instance, Ragnar Lothbrok or Ragnar Lothbroker, uh, you will see in his name a little D. It looks like a D, doesn't it? It's a little curved D with a slant right in the middle of its stem. Uh, and it's not a D at all. That is a letter in Old Norse that we call F. Uh, and it is just another way for us to have the TH sound. You will likewise see today a letter that looks like a P with a very long stem. That's called Thorn. That's another letter in Old Norse that we don't have. That is another way of us doing that TH sound. The reason why we have these extra letters at all is just because when Old Norse made that transition after the Christianization of Scandinavia into Latin alphabet, uh, it had to keep several letters because Latin couldn't accommodate some of the sounds. Old Norse, of course, was written in what we now term as runes, but when it came into the Latin alphabet, it kept a few different letters. But that's just some housekeeping that I kind of wanted to get out of the way so that it wouldn't kind of confuse you about how I pronounce things. I know that I pronounce things differently to other scholars, to other Old Norse historians. I am not specifically an Old Norse historian, which is why my pronunciation might sound different to you. I also studied, when I studied this, I was in Copenhagen, Denmark, so I think the way I say things might skew a little bit more modern Danish or modern Scandinavian than it will to the original Old Norse. So I apologize for that. If you're someone who really, really likes things to be specifically correct, they probably won't be here today because like I said, though I am a historian, this is not my specific field. I am a very general and very broad historian and I love a lot of things, but I love this perhaps most of all. So I'm going to really try. Uh, in Danish, we would say Ivar. So 
Eivar the Boneless is in a lot of these sources across the board. He is perhaps number one historical figure. We know for sure he lived. Uh, we know for sure he was in a wide variety of places, that he led the great heathen army in 865 in England, that he was in Dublin at the founding of Dublin in Ireland. He is mentioned a great deal in the Irish Annals. We will get there. So when we just take him as an example, we know for sure he lived. So we can make some assumptions about people that he was frequently linked to in these historical sources. Uh, such as a man called Ube, and such as a man called Halfdan, and some sources he is called Halfdan the Black, and some sources he is called Witzark, uh, which you might know on the show as Witzark. So when thinking about the main sources, we do in fact have to talk about the Old Norse sources. There are two main Old Norse sources for Ragnar and his sons. And they are both legendary. They are both mythical in the way that Ragnar is himself. This is the basis for the legend of the snake pit. Um, the legend of Ragnar's famous last words, how the little piggies will grunt when they hear how the old boar suffered. Um, Ragnar slaying a giant serpent for the hand of his first wife. Uh, this is all present in these two sources, so you really have to take this with a grain of salt, but without the Old Norse sources, we really don't have the great stories. We don't have the Blood Eagle of King Alla of Northumbria, which is really iconic uh, in Ragnar fan circles, <laughs> Ragnar's sons fan circles in particular. Uh, but these two sources are from around 1300. They were first written down around that time, but of course they are pulling from much older sources. These two sources are Ragnar's Soga Lothbrokar, or the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, and the Totor of Ragnar's Sonum, which is the tale of Ragnar's sons. Uh, these very just a tiny bit in their detailing of events. And of course, the Totor is focusing more on the sons than on the prior period telling the tale of Ragnar's life. It is very much focused on the sons. Uh, and so the sons of Ragnar that are mentioned in these sources come from Ragnar's two named wives. Depending on the sources you read, Ragnar had three wives. Ragnar had four wives. Uh, but these are the children from the two wives mentioned in the Old Norse sources. But he won the hand of his first wife, who is called Thora. Uh, and there you see it. You see the P with the really long stem. Again, that's the letter Thorn. Uh, she had two sons by him, Eric and Agnar. You will occasionally see their names spelled Arikar and Agnar with two R's on the end. R's on the end of Old Norse names, that's just a narrative construct that we don't use in modern English, so we drop it. But you will occasionally see Ragnar's name with a double R on the end or Ivar's name with a double R on the end. You can use it if you want to. I kind of think it looks cool. So those are the two sons from his first marriage. His second marriage is to a woman named Aslaug. She has the most famous sons. Uh, so... Her sons with Ragnar are Ivar the Boneless or Ivar Bane Lousy. You will see that spelling on occasion, depending on certain sources or the age of the translation you read. You will see Bjorn Ironside or Bjorn Jarnside. Uh, you will see Halfdan or Witzerker. Uh, in the saga, you're more likely to see Witzerker. Or Witzerk. And then you will see uh, a brother called Ragnvald or Rogenvalder. Uh, he didn't last very long. That's why his name is not familiar to many people. The older sons also were killed. Uh, so that's why their names are not that familiar. They are probably semi-mythic, if I'm being honest with myself. Really, these other sons, the sons with the names that you know, they are the ones that we can verify. And the last son of Aslaugs is Sigurd, Snake Eye. And in Old Norse, you might see that as Ormir i Alga, which is snake in eye or snake in the eye. And it's just fabulous. So those are the sons that are mentioned in the original Old Norse sources. Uh, and you might be scratching your head if you are a show fan like me because you're saying, where's the best? <laughs> Where is Ube? Uh, Ube is only called a son of Ragnar in 
one of the big sources that we're going to talk about today. So we can segue. The Old Norse sources are great for the story. They are great for the legend, but they are not telling what we might call true historical fact, and that's not their intent, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so when we shift and we move into real historical sources, we can talk about a big one that's also from the late medieval period that is called the Gesta Denorum by a man named Saxo Grammaticus, and this was published in the very early 1200s. This was always intended to be this massive history of the Danes. He wanted the Danes to have a great history book full of their legends uh, and full of all of the stories of their history that they could very easily reference in actual Danish and in Latin. Uh, so this was a great undertaking, but it likewise is not 100% true. Saxo, as well as the saga writers who initially wrote down the sagas there in the early 1300s, specifically with Ragnar's saga when we're talking about it, they were pulling from much older sources that unfortunately haven't made it to the modern day. Uh, and so Saxo was pulling from a slightly different version of events than what wound up in the formal storyline of Ragnar's saga that we have today. So in Saxo's version of events, we have an illegitimate son who is named Ube. Uh, and Ube is a figure who is on the show. He is a figure who is 100% confirmed to be real. He is shown to be, in many, many sources, one of the leaders of the great heathen army and to have been present at the death of the martyr St. Edmund in East Anglia. Uh, so this source is the only one that talks about him as Ragnar's son. Uh, and an illegitimate son at that. He was not a son of any of the wives. But interestingly, this is just a bit of show trivia for you. Uh, Saxo Grammaticus is the only one who mentions Lagertha as a wife of Ragnar. Uh, she is not mentioned in the Old Norse sources at all, but she is mentioned here. So there's a lot of discrepancies between Saxo's version of events, the saga's version of events, the Thothar's so version of events. So it's thought that there was an A and B form of Ragnar's saga and Ragnar's story that was out there. Saxo pulled from one, the person who finally really wrote down the saga in the form that we have it today, pulled from another. Uh, because there's a lot of difference in the version of events and how Saxo talks about figures like Ivar in particular, because Ivar is really the big character in all three of these. If we're being honest, the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok is Ivar's story. And I'm not just saying this because I wrote a 25 page paper on Ivar the Boneless and I just love him quite deeply. Not as much as I love his father, Ragnar, but I do love him quite deeply. Uh, and I think that his characterization in Saxo is really interesting. I think Saxo is an interesting source and should probably be read on its own. Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Denorum is also uh, the basis for Shakespeare's Hamlet. It is the only source that really mentions Hamlet as a historical figure. It's an interesting source in its own right. But it is something else that you should take with a grain of salt. It is almost on the level of the Norse sagas because a lot of what it talks about is also semi-mythical, verging on 100% legend. Then we move into records of the nations that the Vikings raided in. Uh, the Vikings, I've said before, were not great in terms of physical record keeping. Uh, so most of what you have in terms of information about them historically comes from their enemies. So again, take all of this with a grain of salt. The first big historical source that we will talk about, aside from Saxo, is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Duh. Obviously, we have to talk about this. Ragnar's sons are most famous for raiding in England with the Great Heathen Army starting in the years 865 to like 877. Uh, Ivar, Ube, and Wietzirk or Halfdan, they are all shown in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. I will link to a very good modern English version of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that you can find online today. I will link to that down below as well as for all of the annals. Hopefully, if I can find them, as well as Saxo, I will link to Saxo and an older version of the saga and the Thotar if I can find it. 
But uh, if you're interested in that, I do recommend Ben Wagoner's translation of the Saga and the Totor. I think this is a really good modern translation. It's one of the most recent translations we have. But all of the rest of these you can probably find on Project Gutenberg, but I know of a pretty good modern English translation of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, so I will link to that down below. But the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle first started being compiled in the 9th century, probably by the court of King Alfred uh, in Wessex. And so essentially what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle was and what it started out as was this kind of history of the English Isle. This is, of course, before all of the various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms came together and formed the country of England. But it told the story of... England at, of the island, let's just call it like that, of the island and of Wessex in particular since the Roman occupation. So it originally started out as a story from the Roman occupation up to the present day as they knew it. And a copy was sent out to all of these various monasteries across the isle. Uh, so they then updated that independently. So what you get is very different entries for the same year within the same country. Because what you read that happened in 867 in Lincoln might be vastly different than what happened in 867 in Winchester. Uh, so this is a really, really interesting source. It has been streamlined uh, to be put online and everything so that you don't read so many different discrepancies. Uh, which is a very good thing. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle had its agenda too. Saxo Grammaticus is, of course, pushing that the Danes are the greatest of all time. Uh, the saga is, of course, just trying to tell a good story. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is trying to show that King Alfred the Great is the best ever, that Wessex is the greatest of all time, as it's the last kingdom to hold out against the Danes and the Vikings in general. Uh, so it has an agenda it wants to sell. It has a story it wants you to believe. And you need to go into it with fresh eyes. Even when you're reading about Ragnar's sons, maybe specifically when you're reading about Ragnar's sons. But like I said, you will see the name Ube. You will see, uh, you will certainly see Ivar. You will certainly see Ivar or Ingvar. He's sometimes Ingvar or Fwingar. He's got an H in his name occasionally. Ube, you will see is Ubi, uh, Uba, Hubba, uh, they are all various spellings of essentially the same name, and you will also see Hafdan, who I personally believe you can equivocate with Widsark. So there you have three confirmed sons. Uh, so the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that King Ella of Northumbria fell in battle, whereas the Saga and the Thotter both tell us that the sons of Ragnar blood-eagled him in revenge for the death of Ragnar, of throwing Ragnar in the Pit of Snakes. Uh, so the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle kind of clarifies things in a way that maybe those of us who really like stories and legend don't appreciate, but it is a really good source for at least the three of them. Uh, you will also see reference to Bjorn Ironside on occasion in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, but you are more likely to see reference made to him in the Frankish Annals specifically the Annals Fuldenses, and I will try to link to those down below, but Bjorn was mentioned in them because Bjorn is the son who famously went to the Mediterranean. Bjorn supposedly raided a town called Luna in Italy, which is now called Luni, and he mistook it for Rome. Uh, that's a story that's sometimes attributed to Bjorn, but it's sometimes attributed to other people. But Bjorn did raid into the Mediterranean, and so his name shows up far more frequently in the Frankish Annals of the same years, so in the Carolingian Empire, which makes sense when you think about it. But the Carolingian Empire and the Frankish Annals also make mention of Ube, because Ube is potentially a Frisian duke. He is sometimes talked about as ducks of Frisia. Frisia is modern-day Netherlands, Belgium, the Low Countries. Uh, but it was called Frisia at the time. So see Ube, the historical Ube anyway, probably not um, a son of Ragnar at all. He was probably somebody from Frisia. And on occasion, 
Frisians would raid, similar to Vikings, uh, or they made alliances with Vikings and raided with them. Occasionally, they were just victims themselves and were raided as well. It's far more likely that this is the historical Ube. Uh, so potentially a Frisian nobleman who went and raided. So see, it could go various ways with Ube in particular, but I personally think this sounds like a correct theory. That comes from the Frankish Annals. I again will link to a good modern English translation down below. Sigurd, snake in the eye. Now he's a difficult one, isn't he? Because Sigurd and Bjorn both were very active in Sweden uh, and very active in the modern Scandinavian countries, which unfortunately, as I said before, did not keep perfect paper records. They didn't keep paper records at all in most cases. Uh, so what we're left with with Sigurd is a lot of speculation. Sigurd, in some sources, is said to have married Blyja, who would have been the daughter of King Ella of Northumbria. And he is always talked about as kind of the founder of this dynasty of kings in Sweden. Similarly, Bjorn is also talked about in that capacity. Uh, they said until sometime in the 10 hundreds, in the 1000s, the Swedish kings could trace their line back to Bjorn Ironside. That's a little bit more contestable to me, and I'm not quite sure what to tell you in terms of sources for that. So Sigurd is one who might also stray into that realm of legend, uh, specifically because he's kind of talked about as this father of a dynasty, which always carries this mythical quality, this story-like, fairy tale-like quality to it that makes you wonder whether you can really believe what you're hearing. Uh, Sigurd is also, of course, snake in the eye. And sometimes that's talked about as like you literally can see a snake in his eye. Sometimes it's talked about as kind of a split pupil akin to how a snake's eye really looks. Uh, he's one of the sons imbued with this more story-like quality. So I struggle with Sigurd. Which leads me to the Irish annals. Uh, specifically, you want the annals of Ulster. These are really, really great. They were always updated properly, always on time, and they give you a lot, a lot, a lot of information specifically on Ivar. Uh, and Ivar the Boneless is sometimes connected with this figure in Irish history named Imar. Uh, who founded Dublin, who founded this dynasty of kings in Dublin. Uh, and most historians believe that, yes, in fact, Imar is Ivar the Boneless. Uh, and so there's a lot of information about him in the Irish Annals in particular. But I thought this would be a good way to start my Viking series up again, because I know this is a question that probably a lot of viewers of the TV show have, is where can I go to learn about these people in reality? Uh, and perhaps most of all, you want to read the saga and you want to read the Thulter. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's certainly the story that I prefer to hear over the one told by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or the historical annals. But if you are really interested in historical research and you really, really want to dig deep into the sources, these are the sources that I recommend that you look into. Certainly do take a look at the saga and the Thulter. Take a look at Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Denorum. Take a look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Frankish and Irish annals, and I think that you are set in terms of Ragnar's sons. Um, if you have any questions about this, let me know down below. If you want more videos on Ragnar and his family, let me know down below too, because I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.